Hi everyone, good to see you here in the morning, so I think I'll make a start. Um, can everyone on Zoom hear me? I'll take that as a yes then. Okay, so let's make a start. So I'll be presenting neurology and my name is Bowen by the way. Uh, is it mouse click? Oh no, that's the. I think it's on the drawer. Yeah. Oh, sure. I, I just yeah. used this then. Okay. Yeah. So, um, these are some of the resources I used. Um, I highly recommend the anatomy book because, like, uh, I had a look at the neurology section. It is a bit confusing, like, at the end of the book, but it's still quite useful. Like, it's covers all the key principles that you need to know. All right, so, so I yeah, neurology is quite important. You wanna definitely study for it, otherwise it can be a pain in the exam. Um, so embryology, like um, I'll just go quite quickly through this. So the brain, um, so you have the telencephalon that outgrows the other parts and it becomes a cerebrum and the folding causes increased surface area to volume ratio. Okay, now the question. So, it'd be best if somebody answers so we can go through it quite quickly. Anybody have any ideas? D. Um, so the, the answer is E because it's the posterior limb of the, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, sorry about my hay fever. It's the posterior limb of the internal capsule um, that carries the, the motor signals. But like um, the Bromman error that you mentioned is correct and it is the internal capsule. So later on when I'll be talking about strokes, um, you can have purely like motor strokes and this will be in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. <clears throat> okay, now I'll talk about the parts of the cerebral cortex. Right, so you have the lobes of the brain, as you, you guys probably well know already, sulci, grooves, the, the gyria bumps, and then you have the, the landmarks, central sulcus and the lateral sulcus. <coughs> okay, so Brodmann areas, so um, did you guys learn much about Brodmann's areas? Just a few? Yeah, so like, um, I think there's a few important ones to know. So it's important to know um, the primary somatosensory cortex, um, so primary somatis working. Hmm. So primary what? primary somatic sensory cortex, and it's also important to know um, the primary cort primary motor cortex there, primary somatic sensory cortex, and also to know Broca's and Wernicke's area, um, which I'll be talking about later for aphasia. <coughs> okay. So the primary motor cortex, so um, I think they, they had like a um, buzzword that appeared in like past years. So it's kind of starts at the bait cells in the VB part of the cortex. Um, so basically the signal starts in the primary motor cortex, goes down the cortical spinal tract um, to control the contralateral muscles. And then later when I'm talking about the homunculus, it's not exactly like um, one area um, 
that defines so it's not very clearly demarcated but like um i'll show you the image of the homunculus to show um to make it be clearer and um it goes down the posterior limb of the internal capsule <clears throat> so this is the only part that's um when this is not the only part this is only active when executing movements. So when you're imagining that you're doing movements, you're not actually using the primary uh, motor cortex and the lesions will prevent simple movements. All right, the somatosensory cortex. So Brodmann's area 312, um, I guess it's, it's right next to the uh, motor cortex and it's, um, it'll be on the humunculus diagram. Okay, the pre-motor area and the supplementary motor area. So I've included the Brodmann area, but I think it's like less relevant to know. Um, so the, the SMA, the most important part of it is that we use it for planning motor actions. And um, so when we're imagining doing a movement, we're actually using the SMA. And I guess lesion will prevent complex movements. So you might be able to do simple movements, but your complex movements, uh, you might have some difficulties. Um, am I going too fast for everyone? It's like, is it all good? Okay. So now the posterior parietal cortex. So Brodmann's area five and seven, it's less relevant to know the exact area, um, but to know what it does. So this is kind of like, um, allows you to have an internal representation of the body. And um, by the way, if you have any questions, um, it's like ask me at the end because like, I'm not sure how long this will take. All right, so the homunculus, so this is quite important. <clears throat> so we have the motor part and we have the somatosensory part. So you can see based on the area of like how much each part is given, you can see how important it is. So that's why the face, you have like lots of sensation there. This is quite a large part of the brain for it. And that's why when you have strokes, when you have a MCA stroke, MCA, Fix the outer part, so that's why you have symptoms on the face and symptoms on the hands, wrist, the upper body. Whereas if you have an ACA stroke, your symptoms would be on this side. So that's why you would have um, problems with your trunk, problems with your hip, your knees, and your um, feet. And you can see with the um, primary somatosensory cortex that it's that it's pretty similar. So that's why they, they roughly correspond with each other. Yep, so as I sit there, okay, uh, what do people think? B. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it is B, because that should be Broca's area. Yeah. So this is um, Broca's aphasia, or most likely Broca's aphasia, because um, they don't have any problem understanding, but they have problems speaking. So I found this diagram um, online. It's quite useful um, to divide the various type of types of aphasias um, because there's like quite a few types. So I think the most relevant ones to know is Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. And to also gets to know that there's something called global aphasia where they, like, where they can't do any sort of um, these three things and anomic aphasia, which is like, everything seems like, they can do all three of these things, but they're, they're kind of lacking still. So it's kind of the things we look at. Um, so is their speech fluent? If no, then we go down this path. Can they understand? So like sometimes, like um, especially Wernicke's, they, 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 can, they can be saying a lot of stuff, except it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's word salad, like Wernicke's, if that helps you remember and um, repeating. So actually in brokers, they can't repeat, where, and Wernicke's, they can't also repeat. So just remember, if it sounds like it's brokers, aphasia, Wernicke's, aphasia, but they can repeat, then it would be this other type, which I guess those are less rarer. Or I guess more rarer. <clears throat> So here we, we have a diagram. So Broca's area is in the frontal lobe, Wernicke's area is in the temporal lobe. And then that's kind of the connection between them. So when a connection between them is broken, you can have all those like problems re re repeating and stuff. Okay. 
The Brokers area, 44.45. Um, and yeah, another other name for Brokers aphasia is expressive aphasia. So I think Brokers aphasia, like one other thing to remember is they can still, sometimes they can still say like individual words, which makes sense. So if you ask them a question, they can probably still say yes or no, but they can't really give you a sentence response. If you ask a question to somebody with Wernicke's aphasia, they're going to give you some, it's going to be something long, but it's not going to make a lot of sense and they can't understand you. Yeah, so inability to understand and express meaningfully. Okay, so this is just another diagram which you, um, you can define and define them. So I recommend the four things you kind of know really well is Broca's aphasia, um, Wernicke's, anomic and global, and then know of the rest. <coughs> okay, another question. D? Yeah, this is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease um, is related to the basal ganglia, which I'll talk about now. So I think that the basal ganglia can be quite confusing. Like, like based on the history of it, some things used to be classified as something and then they like um, had to change all the classifications. But just I think the most important part is to know um, kind of, I guess, the physiology of how everything works. So the basal ganglia is really important um, for starting and stopping movements. So a good example of this is if I'm walking. So when I'm walking, I want one leg to be going forward at a time. So this leg goes forward, but this leg cannot go forward. So one leg is inhibited from walking, the other one um, can walk. Okay, so I've like tried to find the simplest way to kind of like say parts of the basal ganglia. So I would say this is probably um, the way, four parts, the striatum, globus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. So I put the abbreviations for them here because because now I have this diagram. Have you guys seen this diagram? Yeah. So this diagram I think is probably the most important part of the um, basal ganglia. Um, so much of this what I'm talking about is kind of like um, clinically relevant anatomy rather than pure anatomy because there will be some pure anatomy questions but Many of the questions that Monash likes to ask is like clinically relevant. So, okay. So there's two pathways um, when we want to make a movement. So there's the direct pathway and there's indirect pathway. So the direct pathway, best way to remember is that there's two negatives. So it's like maths. Two negatives makes a positive. So overall, you're going to get a movement. So we start from the cortex, stimulates the striatum, and a striatum um, might take this pathway. So inhibits that, which inhibits this. And then that can result in a movement. Um, the VOO is like a part of the thalamus. Then you have the other pathway, which is the inhibitory pathway or the indirect. So it has three parts, as you can see. So there's one negative, one, another negative, there's a positive here and there's another negative there. So overall, what happens is that three negatives, it's like maths again, overall it's negative. So overall it's going to be all inhibited. And something to note always is that to make it kind of make sense, the thalamus is usually active the whole time. So if you inhibit this, inhibit that, nothing's inhibiting the thalamus, so then the thalamus can send signals. If you inhibit this, inhibit that, stimulates this, which inhibits that, the thalamus is inhibited, so it can't, um, so it's overall inhibitory. I think I've got this on the other thing here. Yeah, I've got it in the word form. Um, something else important to note is that um, dopamine has a um, excitatory effect. So dopamine from the substantia nigra can actually, actually like, um, affects both of these pathways. Thanks. 
So it affects both of these pathways. But overall, it favors um, D1, it favors a direct pathway. So that's why when you have dopamine's, um, sorry, Parkinson's disease, you have um, many of the problems with movement, because you have problems starting a movement. So then you get symptoms like a pure rolling tremor, bradykinesia, lead pipe, cogwheel rigidity, postural instability. Um, so something interesting to note is that with um, cogwheel rigidity, it basically is lead pipe rigidity plus the tremor. Um. What do people think? This is like um, a fairly difficult question, but like, um, so what do people think? D? Yeah, D is the correct answer. Okay. So the best way to work through these sort of questions, like these sort of questions um, can be quite hard. Like if you just see this, it's like, how do I do this? But the best way to work through it is to um, kind of think what is happening. So I, I highlighted some of the key words. So vibration and proprioception. So vibration and proprioception, um, that would be DCML. So that would be relevant for these ones. These ones would be the spinothalamic tract, so then we can just kind of exclude these answers. All right. Then the second part is this requires a bit of like knowledge about like where the um, where the umbilicus is. So the umbilicus is around T10. So then it kind of leaves us with these two answers. And then the next part is gracilis, like um, a way to remember gracilis is that gracilis is like in the legs, gracilis is like grass when you're like standing on grass it's with your feet so then normally like this one is more for the legs the lower body this one cuneate is more for the upper body so based on that you'll be able to choose um, d and also yeah you can look at the sides because because uh dcml it has already decussated so it's already crossed, so if it's already crossed and then there's a lesion, then it's already crossed onto the left side, there's a lesion, then therefore the problem would be on the left side. Does that all make sense? Okay, another question. What do people think? Did I hear D? Yeah. yeah. It is D. So, so initially, like um, it's kind of it's kind of like a stroke, like a um upper motor neuron lesion. So initially they're not gonna really have any movements at all, they can't move their limb at all. But then once some time passes, then it's going to have the typical side of a upper motor neuron lesion. Okay, so the spinal tracts. So this diagram, quite important to remember. Like you guys probably learned about this in anatomy. There's a lot going on. So, but I think the most important pathways to remember are the pyramidal tracts, these ones, uh, DCML and anterior lateral. Like I guess spinal cerebellar, they're yes, less important and extra pyramidal tracts. Like I think there's kind of only really one buzzword with one of these, but like they're not as important to remember. 
Just remember roughly where they are located and what they do. I think it's possible they could give you a question like uh, they have a, um, if they have like a, a ventral lesion on the spinal cord, what structure could most likely be affected? So it's possible they could give you those sorts of questions. So then it's important to know um, where they are in the spinal cord. All right, so, so here we have um, DCML, so vibration and proprioception and some other functions. So you can see here that it is desiccated at the medulla. Um, so um, it, to, to learn these pathways like quite well, what I would recommend is looking through the anatomy book. Um, I think they still have like those diagrams um, of the spinal cords and all the paths. So to look through those, to label them, to understand how they work, um, because that would be the best way to remember um, what these pathways uh, do, where they go from and where they start. So as I was talking before, there's two parts of it. So one is kind of um, the upper body, one is the lower body. So just remember kind of like, where one starts and where one ends, because that would help you differentiate them. Anterior lateral. So there's uh, two parts for this. So the first one is the lateral spinal thalamic tract. So it's pain and temperature. And the other one is the anterior spinothalamic tract, so it's crude touch and pressure. Um, they, they roughly, they go along the same pathway, but just know that there's two parts to this. Okay, the spinal cerebellar tract, I guess, less important to know. So it's like unconscious proprioception. So it's kind of like when you close your eyes, um, you know, like, where parts of your body are. And the important thing to, I guess, to know about this is that there's two parts to it, I guess, basically the same because one decussates twice, one does not decussate. So when you have a lesion, um, then it will be just on the same side of your body. Okay, the pyramidal tracks, um, the motor one, this is uh, quite important. So it's like when we're starting off, we're starting off from the primary motor cortex, going through the internal um, the posterior limb of the internal capsule, um, going down through the medullary pyramids, and decostating. So that's the yeah, the lateral one. And there's also two um, for this one. So there's there's a lateral one, which is the most important one. Uh, so the lateral decostates at the medulla at the pyramids, and then there is the anterior one for the upper body, but um, it's like quite small relative to the lateral one. So even though it might, it decussates in a um, different region, if you had a stroke, you're still basically going to lose all your like, um, if you had a lesion, you're still going to lose basically all the um, important motor function. And then it's corticobulba. So corticospinal is kind of like the motor system for the whole body. Um, corticobulba is kind of the motor system kind of for your face and neck. I was going to make this a question. Okay, you guys probably saw that. So, yeah, I think it's really important to know the difference between the upper motor neuron lesion and a lower motor neuron lesion. So, upper motor neuron lesions, um, central nervous system, lower motor ne neuron lesions, peripheral nerves. Why is this important? Um, because it yes, really um, affects where you would localize the lesion. We see if they have upper motor neuron lesion signs, you're kind of thinking the problem is at the spinal cord or the brain. But if they have lower motor neuron lesion signs, it could be that they've severed a peripheral nerve. So I guess tone. So this is like during your um, neurological examination. This is why you assess tone. Because if an upper motor neuron lesion, they have increased tone. I guess they're specific, um, and they can also have some clonus. Um, so for both of these, you have muscle weakness. Um, so if the upper motor neuron lesion, the reflexes would be increased and opposite for the lower motor neuron lesion. 
I think um, the plantar response is also quite important. So you do it, the toe goes up, then you're like, this is our upper motor neuron lesion. Um, <coughs> so fasciculation, they're also... <coughs> does somebody want to shut off their mic? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So fasciculations, they're um, primarily present in the lower motor neuron lesions. So it's like the neurologic examination, why do you kind of flip their arms it's to see if they have any fasciculations and if they have fasciculations and you're thinking of the lower motor neuron lesion. Um, so this is quite important to remember. So even though it's, it may sound like, okay, we have increased tone for the upper motor neuron lesion, we're not really going to get any muscle wasting. Um, I guess kind of due to disuse, you do get muscle wasting with upper motor neuron lesion, but it'll be quite late and um, it'll be less severe than lower motor neuron lesion wasting. And for both, both of these, you wouldn't get any rigidity because that's an extra pyramidal thing. So now I've kind of for each of these. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, yeah, so this is the difference between spasms and rigidity. So rigidity is really just like an extra pyramidal thing. So it's kind of like um, why you get rigidity with, I guess, Parkinson's disease because it's like dopamine, it's an extra pyramidal pathway. Okay. All right, so the extra pyramidal tracks, so it's less important to know as I mentioned. I think the only pretty important one to know is tectospinal, because I believe there have been like questions in the past. It's like you hear really loud noise and then this motor pathway that makes you like reflexively like turn that turn your head. That would be tectospinal. What do people think? C? Yeah, C is correct. A tax here. So for these sort of questions, you want to know what part of the cerebellum does what. So then you so then based on I guess the symptoms that they're having, you can work out um, what part. So this is kind of summary table of, I guess, the three parts of the cerebellum. So each of these parts um, does something different. Um, so a lesion in your vestibular cerebellum will give you problems with your balance, your gait, um, eye movement issues. So basically a good way to remember this is um, remember cranial nerve eight, vestibular uh, cochlea. So it's kind of the do to ears and your ears help balance. So vestibular cerebellum would be kind of like problems with your balance. Um, spinal cerebellum. Uh, this is, so spino, um, cerebellum. So you're kind of thinking of spine and your cerebellum. So then you would have problems with coordination. Because the, the whole purpose of the cerebellum is to kind of like smooth out all your movements. So if you had a problem with your spinal cerebellum, you would have problems with the finger nose test as you would have problems with coordination. And then the cerebellum. So that's kind of high function. So cerebrocerebellum, you're thinking kind of the, um, you're thinking that they would have kind of like problems with learning as well. So this is kind of the one where if there's a lesion, they're gonna have problems with, um, I think, uh, motor memory. Okay, yeah, and also, yeah, remember which part of this, Cerebellum is corresponds to each of these functions. Yeah, so I've gone through it already. 
And just remember, once again, it double decker states. But one of them double decker states, one of them doesn't decker state at all. So then you'd have problems on the same side of the lesion. Okay. So here, a good mnemonic, just remember, like, if they're having all these sort of weird symptoms, a good mnemonic to remember is um, Danish. Yeah, just know the um, cerebellar peduncles. Okay. Now I'm moving into strokes. So what do people think? This is, this is a, um, yes, um, fairly hard, but I'll go through this question. So this, this, one, this one is kind of like a buzzwordy as well once you um, learn to it. Are people saying B? What are people saying? Does somebody just want to quiet something? Mm, close, but it's not D. It's A. So this is, <coughs> excuse me. This is um, lateral medullary syndrome. So yeah, like um, the brainstem strokes, they're like quite difficult to learn. Because I'll, I'll be going through the cerebral strokes um, but like the brain stem strokes are quite hard to learn. So over here, you can see that's like Horner's syndrome. You've got some problems potentially uh, with cranial nerve eight, You've got some problems potentially with cranial nerve uh, nine and 10. So I'll, I'll go through this question. But you're quite um, close to guessing this one because it is like both, this one would give you somewhat similar things. Okay. So let's go through the rule of fours. So I think the rule of fours is really good for brainstem strokes and it's really good to, uh, help, it helps you remember the anatomy. So you can so you easily know where the cranial nerves come out from the brainstem. Okay, so rule of fours. So there's four cranial nerves that come above the pons. So just remember like, uh, this is, I think some um, neurologists made this to help like medical students um, better understand this. So it's not 100% correct. So cranial nerves one and two, they don't actually come out from the brain. So it's four above the pons, four, oh, sorry, yeah, four above the pons, four in the pons, and four in the medulla. So then for that question, um, it sounded like they had a problem with, uh, it sounded like they had a problem with cranial nerves, it's nine and 10. So then that, that kind of localizes you to the medulla. So there's some problem in the medulla. So that's the first one. So then rule two. So it's a bit of maths here, but I think you guys can handle it. So since there's 12 cranial nerves, it has lots of like um, <coughs> factors. So Basically, all the numbers that can divide equally into 12, except one and two, cross in the midline. So this would be like, uh, it's cranial nerve 12 itself, I guess six, I guess three and four. Um, but like, once again, this is a bit simplified. They're not really in the mean line, midline, they're paramedian. So then based on that question, let's have a look. Wait, let me just get it. So there's no problem with cranium, uh, there's no problem with cranium nerve 12, and 12 is in the midline. So then I guess it's less likely uh, to be a problem uh, with the midline of the medulla. So it's more likely to be lateral. And also, um, cranial nerves, I guess, 9 and 10. They, they wouldn't be in the midline, they'll be the lateral places. So you're thinking lesion is in medulla, the lesion is lateral. So most likely lateral medullary syndrome. 
And then of course, there's one other thing to help you remember where this lesion might be. You can use these two other rules. So you can kind of use this to confirm um, that you have the right answer. So we have Horner's syndrome. Horner's syndrome is due to a problem with the sympathetic system. So Horner's syndrome, if you see Horner's syndrome, you're thinking it's a problem with the sympathetic system, it's likely to be lateral. And we have some other ones here as well. So they're having problems with their motor functions. That's like the corticospinal, that's the medial tract. Um, so where else might you also get Horner's syndrome? This is throwing it out to everyone. Sorry? Yeah, a pain costume, yeah. Because like anything that affects the sympathetic tract, you would get Horner's syndrome. Okay, so now I've just summarized um, lateral medullary syndrome and medial medullary syndrome. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, other part of this to remember is they also like to ask questions about blood vessels. So that's why uh, I was asking for which blood vessel. So you need to remember the blood supply of, I guess, the brainstem. Because... Because if you found this, if you thought it was, I think, medial medullary syndrome, then this part is supplied by the anterior spinal artery. So then you would have chosen ASA. But since you found it was the, the lateral medullary syndrome, it would be PICA. I think PICA, like the lateral medullary syndrome, is like probably the, the most important one to know. I like to ask questions on this. What do people think? C? Yes, C is correct. So I've included some head and neck stuff, but this is primarily for your own reference, as I guess uh, you guys have the um, head and neck I guess, lecture coming up. Okay, um, but I'll talk a little bit about the cranial nerves. <coughs> so do you guys have like some sort of like mnemonic for remembering the, or some sort of like acronym um, for remembering the 12 cranial nerves? So it's quite important to know these 12 cranial nerves. Like, so the one I like to use is Oh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it's one of the more tame ones because there's some like, bit like, like not, not safe for work out there. So that's a very good one to remember. So, so it's, it's, it's good, like you might remember them now, but during the exam, if you suddenly forget, you can always refer back to your mnemonic and then you can derive the 12 cranial nerves from that. Something else I think important to know is to know which cranial nerves provide motor function, which ones have sensory function. So another one to remember is some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. Yeah, there, there's a not, not um, safe for work version of that out there, but like that would help you remember like which, uh, that would help you remember like the functions of the cranial nerves. Yeah, so this, this has a lot of stuff written here. Um, yeah, and just to know, some of these cranial nerves have parasympathetic function. So that would be cranial nerves 3, 5, 9, and 10. I guess the sympathetic function is done by the um, sympathetic tracts there. Okay, bit of a blurry image, but the other thing important to remember, which I think um, Wendy will be covering in the head and neck lecture, it's know where the cranial nerves exit. Because like that question, they could very well be like, okay, they have a problem with their, uh, they injured their jugular foramen. What cranial nerves are they going to injure? It could very well ask you a question like that because it's like clinically relevant anatomy. Okay.
What do people think? I think I heard a D. So yes, it would be problems. Yeah, so they still can have some symmetrical wrinkling of their forehead. Because in the cortico um, bulbar tract, the, um, there is some, do I talk about it? Yeah. So you wouldn't, if you had like, if you had a lesion, upper motor neuron lesion for the cortical bulbar, you're not going to always lose function um, on, the, on the relevant side. Except, except there's some exceptions, which is like the lower half of the face and the tongue. Um, because some of these, um, they don't have that. So the reason why I have this question is they love to mention symmetrical wrinkling of the forehead because if they had a stroke, would they have symmetrical wrinkling of the forehead? Yes, they would. What about Bell's palsy? No, yeah. This, this, this is like one of their favorite questions to ask. With Bell's palsy, lower motor neuron lesion, it's not gonna, they're not gonna be able to wrinkle their forehead. Okay, what do people think? So I didn't put the buzzwords there purposefully because you guys should know kind of what it means. See? Yeah, C is correct. Loss of peripheral lights. Loss of peripheral vision. So that question is one of their favorite questions to ask. But they could mix it up like that. Then they might not say, um, they might not say. I guess, was it bitemporal heminopia? So I think I've bold, I bolded the important ones to know. So if they have a problem with just one of their eyes, there's lost vision, then the lesion would be here. If they have a problem at the optic chiasm, like the pituitary adenoma, then they would have this. Other one to kind of note is that um, with strokes, if you have a PCA stroke, it, it would be, it's macular sparing because it would be macular sparing. Um, let's go and mention this. But just know kind of what the terms mean. Because if, you, because if you just remember the buzzwords, you don't know what the terms mean, then you wouldn't know that like loss of peripheral vision is the bitemporal hemianopia. Okay. Yeah. So here I have like a um, picture, I guess, of the circle of Willis, and then kind of kind of its like location, I guess, on the brain stem. So you can see, yeah, so you can see Pico over here and you can see the interior spinal artery there. What type of, um, where do we, which artery is occluded? Yeah, B. If you have to guess something, always, always guess the middle cerebral artery because it's like, it's the most commonly occluded artery and then it kind of has the like biggest range of I guess like symptoms. Okay, so here I've summarised it very, very summarised it quite a bit. 
Um, so just know like the greater regions of the brain. So like the way I like to remember, this is what they used. The last year they had like a guy, a mohawk. So then this mohawk represents the blood supply of the anterior cerebral artery. So it would be this part. It's kind of like a mohawk here. Middle cerebral artery has, has parts of the frontal lobe, has parts of the primary um, motor cortex. And then the posterior cerebral artery has parts of the vision. So the middle cerebral artery, you can see that it would affect Broca's and Wernicke's area. So that's why middle cerebral artery strokes, you have problems with speech. So it could be Wernicke's, it could be Broca's. The anterior cerebral artery, you have problems with the legs. Because remember, based on homunculus, the legs is on this side. Whereas over here, you have the arms and the upper body, the face, because based on homunculus, it would feature on this side. Um, reason why I've added some asterisks to the PCA stroke is that, like, yes, yeah, the posture, uh, the occipital lobe, it does do vision. But if you have something with, like, they have a stroke, they have some problems with their vision, they also have problems with their arms, and they have problems with their speech. If you have that situation, that can be, like, quite confusing. You might think, oh, this is still PCA, but it's vision. But, like, remember... Go back. Remember this. <clears throat> this goes through, I think, these parts of the brain. So then MCA supplies parts of this. So you have a MCA stroke, you would have like kind of like prob um, damage through this. So then you could still get some vision problems. Was MCA is quite broad, like. There's like many segments of it, depending on the segment, if we get something more specific, but just, just know broadly kind of like what can occur. So you can have some problems with um, vision with the MCA stroke. So if you do get something like speech problems, um, problems with their arms, face, and problems with their vision, it's most likely going to be MCA rather than PCA. Um, this is kind of just added this for your own reference because like many of these terms, they can get quite confusing. So like, you can just refer to this. I think out of all these terms, the most important one probably to know is uh, what a, one that can be the most challenging is hemi neglect. So it's just like when they have hemi neglect, they just, one half of their body just ceases to exist to them. Okay, so over here, I've just, um, this is, I guess, the, the broader version of that. Yeah, you can get a contralateral homonymous heminopia. Yeah. For the guy from yesterday. What do you people think? What do people think? Okay. The answer for this one would be I would like to say it's F, but it's it's um D. So meningitis. So like so I'm not sure. Have you guys learned about meningitis? Yeah. I'm just I just only have like this one question on it because like Meningitis, I think it's, I think it may appear as a question, but it's kind of more of a third year thing. So basically to know what meningitis is, you have these kind of symptoms. Photophobia, so sensitivity to light, neck stiffness, headache, and a fever. And I guess, apparently some sort of like buzzword is like, it's like a university student who's living on horse. Yeah, I know, like, which is like some of you guys. So like, Apparently, we're kind of like um, the sort of demographic for meningitis. That's why I think the government, they had like a free meningococcal vaccine that was like implemented. 
So, um, I want to talk about this. So, meninges, I think this will be covered a bit in head and neck. So, I think the most important thing to know is like knowing the layers, to know of like the subarachnoid space. So, in the subarachnoid space, you have CSF. Um, yeah, you see it, CSF, and you have the racks. You have, oh, I don't think I've included it here. Yeah, but also know that the, um, the layers of the meninges, they just like they go down and fresh the spinal cord. Okay, I include it. So, menin meningeal arteries, like. Less important to know, but if you guys can see it, which artery should you know? Yeah, the middle meningeal artery. It's like pretty buzzword, middle meningeal artery, fractal pterion, extradural or epidural hemorrhage. Like, I think we had a lecture, we called it like epidural hemorrhage and then the lecture was no, it's an extradural hemorrhage, but they're basically the same thing. So I think I just use them interchangeably, those terms. Yep, the venous system, so, so the venous system, so it receives fluid from uh, the subarachnoid space at the arachnoid granulations. And then it all just like drains through. I'll also be talking about the, um, uh, the, the CSF system as well, so you can see how it all links together. Um, some of you, this is kind of just interesting, interesting is like, what is so like? What is the difference between a sinus and what is the difference between a vein? So just like the difference is that like a sinus it has like zero muscle layer, but still the veins still have like a small muscle layer. You have the dural reflection, so you have the false cerebri, the tentorians, cerebelli. Okay, and I put it here. Okay, so in interest of time, I'll keep going forward. This is um, a question that is quite likely to appear. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Does somebody want to quiet the answer? A, yes. Yes. So this is an epidural hemorrhage. So they really like to ask this question because what occurs is they lose unconsciousness. So like they, they, um, from the injury, they've been concussed, but then they recover. But then what happens is that they have an epidural hemorrhage. So they, they've recovered, they're normal, but they're still bleeding in their brain. And once that reaches the critical mass, then they just collapse. So it's like where they have like a lucid period of time. So they're fine for like a few hours. And then kind of these things, they kind of like, um, kind of, I guess, due to the compression. Okay. So there's three potential spaces where you can bleed into. So epidural. So that's, dural would be here. So epidural is artery, middle meningeal artery. So that's kind of the reason why it's very like acute. Subdural is the bridging veins. So it's like less acute, you can have a chronic subdural and just kind of be fine. And then subarachnoids in the, the subarachnoid space. So normally in a subarachnoid space, we should only find CSF. But if you have blood there, then that's most likely subarachnoid hemorrhage. All right, let's do some imaging because I think, I think there's a reasonable chance this could appear. Spot diagnosis. Somebody want to shout at the answer? Be brave. Subdural. Yeah, perfect. Subdural. So subdural because so subdurals, as I mentioned before, they're mostly chronic. They result from the rupture of a bridging vein. So these ones, um, the cause is like most likely not trauma. So it's in alcoholics because they have poor clotting function. Apparently, like shaken baby syndrome, you can was when they're younger, you rupture the veins, and then old old people, that's meant to say. 
Because like when you get older, your brain gets stretched, those brains get rupture. So yeah, I know I added a banana onto there. So where you remember, you can just think, if, does it, what does it look like? If it's a crescent or banana, then it's a subdural. And it's, it's kind of to do with the layering, I guess, of the meninges. What is this? Epidural, yeah, this is an epidural. So I think you can even see the fracture tear on there. Yeah, so, so epidural, extradural, you can think of it like on imaging as a lemon. Because it bulges out quite a bit because like, um, I can see quite a lot of people talking. Does this all make sense to you? Yeah, good. So it's like a lemon because it's an arterial bleed. So that's why it's more acute. You're not really ever going to have a chronic uh, epidural hemorrhage. So the buzzword, like that question, is you have trauma, you have a period of unconsciousness, you have a lucid period, and then you can fall unconscious again. What about this? This, this could be an easy like, process, process of elimination. What do you have left? What can this be? Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah, I know this one loosely fits. Like it kind of does look like a crab. So if you see something that looks a bit weird, like it's not at here, it's kind of very center. It looks like it's got legs or something or limbs. Then that's what the subarachnoid hemorrhage would look like. So the reason why it does this is because I think the the pia mater is like directly on the brain. So that's where the blood is just kind of like following the contours of the brain. So the buzzword is this, it's like some random person has a thunderclap headache, which is like the worst headache that they've ever had. Or it can be like, it feels like they've been hit in the head by a baseball bat. So this one is, this can result from trauma, but this is most likely, it's just like, um, it can be like, they don't have any trauma. So this is acute and this is, quite bad and dangerous. Was it like an artery, the vertebral, the sewer artery? So now here, I'm going to go into timing at 12 minutes. Now here I'd like put them, show them. So subdural, banana, crescent, epidural, lemon, subarachnoid, looks like a crab. <coughs> So here's another summary of all that information. Okay. So which structure is not located in the highlighted area? Did somebody say A? Yes, the third ventricle. Okay, the ventricular system. Because you can see that the third ventricle <coughs> is up here. So then basically, just know how the ventricles, how they drain. So they start off from the lateral, the lateral ventricles, drain into the intraventricular foramen, go to the third ventricle, go into the cerebral um, aqueduct, go into the fourth ventricle, and then ultimately, I think they go into the, like the, ultimately they go into the subarachnoid space and then drain into the sinuses or the veins. So I think the kind of the only really important thing to know about this is that you can have, um, yeah. So they also yeah, produce bidochoroid plexuses. So each of the ventricles can produce CSF. Um, so here's, I illustrated it here. And if it's still a bit confusing, you can always go on YouTube look up some videos of this and you can see how they drain. It's so important thing to know is if you have increased CSF or you've increased anything in the brain, you can get something called brain herniation. So basically there's just way too much stuff. Um, it's way too much pressure. What happens is then this pressure pushes the brain down through the spinal cord. And when this happens, it's like, it's really bad and most likely it results in death. So I guess the cause of this could be increased CSF, but it also could be something called um, hydrocephalus, um, where it's blocked, potentially. Okay, question. These are the questions that I'm going to ask you, not um, the ones that you're going to ask me. 
All right, so I've talked about this. What is the answer? C? Yes, the answer is C. So remember, when you're using this part, you have to be like actively doing a movement. When you're imagining you're doing something or when you're planning something, like it's like if you're imagining playing tennis, then the part of the brain you'll be using is, the, uh, is this part. <clears throat> what about this? A, yes, A is correct. So remember, uh, I think the substantial nigra reduces the dopamine, so then when in Parkinson's disease, when those uh, nuclei die off, you don't have enough dopamine. And remember, dopamine favours the, uh, the direct pathway, which leads to movements. So when there's not, not enough movement, you're going to have hypokinesia. Hypokinesia. Uh, ultimately lead to like your decreased reduction in the cortical function. Yeah, this is this is quite a difficult um, question. Hmm? Yeah, it is D. So I would go all the way and then find rewind time. Okay, so homonymous, monomous, hemianopia is when they're on the same sides of the brain. So you can see over here. That is kind of the lesion that they're describing. Let's go back. Yeah, we're almost done. And then you can have your head and neck. What is this? Do you say E? E is correct. Very guy, glad you guys have fun answering the questions. <clears throat> so for this question, so if you had a quick look at this, you might be like, oh, this could be Parkinson's. They've got a tremor. They've got something wrong with their gait. And they're just, I was like, oh, like, I don't know. Maybe we get to my stuff. So the reason why this is cerebellar is because uh, I think the main thing you should like, look at is nystagmus. Like for second year level, just all the causes of nystagmus are like cerebellar. So you see nystagmus, you think some sort of cerebellar lesion. Right. What do you think you see? B? Yep, B. So, fasciculations, when you like, like, I don't know, took, like immediately afterwards when you have a stroke, you're going to have all this like weakness, you can't move your limbs and all that stuff. But then that like stops after a period of time and then you get to upper mode in your own science. So if I ask you this like, I don't know, four hours ago after you had a stroke, then the answer, it would, it could be this and it could be this. I'm not, I'm, I'm not too sure on that, but just know that one week is like a reasonable period of time. Yeah, very short term, they're gonna have water kind of like, like, like they can't move anything. Yeah, muscle wasting, if this was like two years, they could have muscle wasting from the upper motor neural lesion. Increased muscle strength. Remember the strength is not increased, it's just kind of a tone. 
Cewek Pomeston All right, so how about I just quickly go through, does, does anybody want to shout out an answer? Like go through the rule course? If not, I'll just quickly go through it. Okay. The, um, I believe the answer is Eve. All right. This, yeah, this is quite a challenging question. So basically, rule four is what cranial nerves are involved? Vertigo, right facial muscle weakness, loss of coordination. So. We kind of think, okay, vertigo, vertigo is kind of always like, um, I think cranial nerve eight. So then we're thinking the pons. So then we have the pons. And then it's the left pons or the right pons. And then we look at this. We look at where, um, where they're having their lesions. Sorry? Um, I believe... I, um, I think it has decorated already. Let me just have a check. Um, because some of these questions are from last year. So like... Um, so... I'll, I'll come back to this question. Okay, wait. That was the last question. Okay. Let's leave this here. Uh, I'm, I'm getting asked for that. Yeah. Um, I hope that was helpful. I like. Um, I have to admit, I spend a bit too much time on just trying to make random memes and actually, and like, <laughs> spend more time than I should have on memes. But like, yeah. So, neurology is important. Study for it. Do well. Finish the exam. Don't worry about it. Like. Your mark on the exam is not really going to reflect what sort of doctor you're going to be. I just know that next year, it's next year you basically can forget all your anatomy until fourth year. Like next year, it's all like medicine. Like none of the physicians know any sort of anatomy. It's, it's kind of sad. So anatomy really is a surgery thing. So yeah. Okay, I hope that has been helpful and send through some questions and then yeah, no worries. If any questions, just like.